Hello. It's doing all right? Now, I need to make sure, because Barry said it, but I make sure you heard it. Um, next week, we go to one service, right? So it's 1030. If you get here at 930, like you normally do, that's okay. We'll find something for you to do. That's, we call that volunteering, okay? So feel free to show up early. That's not a problem at all. Now, so anyway, we're, we're in a series called Kingdom Here, and it's, we talk about a lot. We'll hear about, about the kingdom of God and all that stuff, and we talk about it a lot. Matter of fact, if you, if you look in the book of Philippians, it'll say our citizenship, if we're a Christian, our primary citizenship is in heaven, and we're anxiously awaiting that. And, but a lot of times we don't talk about what does that mean? Practical application, if I am living in and for the kingdom of God, what does that look like? So I need to back up a little bit, and we're going to take the next four weeks, and we're going to talk about this concept. And we'll start here. This is something I t- talk about a lot, talked about at Easter, used this drawing. In, this is God's big story. This is how God to- tells the story of the universe. And we start out with creation. At the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth. And it's very good until humans screw it up in the fall. And that creates all kinds of lots and lots of problems. But eventually, we work our way to Jesus and redemption. And then coming out of redemption, we move toward the restoration where God will restore everything back to being very, very good. Now, if you look at the picture, where do we live? We don't live here. That was 2,000 years ago. We live here, but it's kind of weird because it doesn't feel like we're here, does it? Does it feel like everything's getting restored? When you, when you, when you, if you happen to catch the news, was there anything happening news-wise the past? It seemed like there was something happening recently. Does it seem like everything is getting restored? Does it seem like we're cruising toward a b- glorious future? It doesn't feel like it a lot of the times. But if you'll notice... Talking about kingdom, in the drawing, they have a crown because there is a king. And we are looking at how do we live under the king, Jesus Christ? How do we live in his kingdom now? It's not something we're waiting for in the future. We live the kingdom now. It will be fulfilled in the future, but we're living it now. So how do we live in and as the kingdom of God? What does that mean? Because a lot of times we can go real theological and we talk about it, but we don't say, what's it mean? How does it apply? And if you think about it, this is how we're going to look at it for the next four weeks. If you're going to have a kingdom, you need four things. You need a king. You've got the king's power and authority. He's over something. He has people who are his subjects. And he has a place that the kingdom is at, the location. And we're going to take all four of those over the next four weeks. And we're going to examine them. And how does that impact me? How does that impact you? How, does, how do you live as a citizen of the kingdom of God? Okay, Because 2 Corinthians, Paul said it this way, we are Christ's ambassadors. Th- th- that's our job title. Now, this is something really important, and I'll, we'll, we'll get to it a lot, but I'm just going to remind you of this right now. If you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, if that's, if that's your thing, if you say that out loud, the way that I say that out loud, I am a follower of Jesus Christ, That means my primary citizenship is in heaven. Okay, Now, I am a proud citizen of the United States, but I am primarily an ambassador to the United States from the kingdom of heaven. Right? I say, right? That's that's, that's the challenge to live that way. So, today we're going to talk, though, about the king. We're going to establish who the king is real clearly, and so we're going to start there. Now, we're going to be in Luke chapter 4. And I need to give you a run-up to it because it's very important you understand what's been going on. Um, Luke 2, you know Luke 1 and 2, that's the nativity and shepherds and all that stuff, right? In, in Luke 3, Jesus is baptized. Now, as Charles Spurgeon says, and I kind of agree with him, that Jesus' baptism was his coronation. That's when he was officially named the king. Jesus is placed into the water when he comes out. You guys remember the Bible geeks in the room, remember what, he, God, what happens then? There's a voice from heaven, and it says, this is my beloved son, and I'm well pleased in him. And when this one says, this is my son, he's announcing, this is the king. Jesus comes out of the water, and in the way Luke positions everything, Jesus comes out of the water. Then Luke gives a genealogy. We always love the genealogies. But this one ties Jesus all the way back to God. It starts out, Jesus was supposed to be the son of 
da, 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 you know, the son of, the son of, the son of. Then it goes all the way to the end. It says the son of Abraham, the son of Abraham. Then it works on farther back, the son of Adam, the son of God. Oh, and Jesus is going to be the son of God. Okay. Then the next thing that happens in Luke and everywhere else too is Jesus goes into the wilderness and he's tempted by the devil for 40 days. That's his first battle in the kingdom. This is the first hand-to-hand combat in the kingdom of God. And when he comes out of that, now this is what I want to show you in Luke, is Luke chapter 4, he's going to say, Jesus then returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. Now, Luke's going to cover that in one or two verses. This is not a quick thing. This takes months. Jesus is going to do, if you, if you go to the Gospel of John, you'll see all kinds of things happening. But what Jesus is doing in these verses is he's establishing his power as a teacher. But Luke doesn't want to dwell on it. Because Luke wants to tie one more thing to the whole process. Because he talked about his coronation, when he's baptized, his ascendancy, his temptation, and now there's the announcement of his kingdom. He wants, he wants you to be there and tie this all together and understand this is where Jesus tells everybody who he is. There are sometimes people say, Jesus didn't claim to be. Oh, watch what Jesus does here. Okay, this is Luke chapter 4. And then it says that Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue. And as it was his custom, he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Now, Jesus had the choice of how he was going to do this. This is what he decided to announce. This is how he decided to announce himself. Proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, it's important that, that, see that period right there? See that period? Remember that period. It's kind of important. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, he stops, he rolls up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. Because in those days, if you're teaching in a temple or a synagogue, the teacher sat down. So he stood up to read the word of God because that was important. And then when he was done reading it, he hands the scroll back, and he sits down, and he starts to teach. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him because they've heard how amazing a job he's doing as a teacher. They've heard the miracles. They've heard all the stuff. This is the local boy who's come back. He's been doing amazing work. He began by saying, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I'm the guy. Okay, I'll show you what it means in just a second. And all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious word that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? And I used to think that was negative. I don't think it is. It's just local boy done good. Did you hear that guy? Yeah, he's one of us. He went to high school with my kid. Yeah, he, 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 he ran track with my son. Yeah. yeah. His brother took my daughter to prom. Right? This is, that's what they're saying. They're saying, hey, look, at, look at what our guy did. Now, the thing is, he's poked them, but they haven't picked up on it. He's poked them rather hard, and they haven't noticed it. Now, in a, in a, in a minute here, he's going to two-hand shove them. But here it's just, just a hint, just a poke, okay? And what he's telling them, and they're not getting it, but we can get it because I'll show you why we can get it. What he's saying is kingdom living is about Jesus. Now, We can go in all kinds of directions, but kingdom living is about Jesus. It's not about church. It's about Jesus, okay? Now, the one thing he said, he said one thing that was absolutely huge. He was reading from Isaiah, and and he's going to say, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And what he said was, he has anointed me. Now, let me see. I'm going to do this real fast. It's not a big deal. Who's he? This is not a complicated question. Huh? God, God the Father, has anointed who? Sunday school answer? Jesus. Okay. That's not the big part. The big part's right here. The word anointed. Anointed. We had to look it up because we didn't remember, but a few months ago, Queen Elizabeth died. And 
like he's King Charles now, but he's been Prince Charles my entire life, and I don't think I'll get over calling him that. But anyway, King Charles goes, and they put the crown on his head, and do you know what else they do as part of it? If you watch the crown, you probably saw this. There was a really intense scene of where the king isn't just crowned, he's anointed. You anoint kings, especially in a religious setting like this. The king is anointed. Now, that's pretty cool, isn't it? Jesus said, I've been anointed. Came up out of the water, I've been anointed. Wait, just wait. The word anointed is a Greek word, obviously. It's in the New Testament. The root for the verb is, of course, anoint. The, the noun, you ready? The noun behind this Greek word is Christos. Christ. The word for Christ, when you see the word Christ in the New Testament, the word Christ is the Greek word for anointed one. And you know what the Greek, okay, we're, 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 don't you love the language stuff? The Greek word is Christ. You know what the Hebrew word is? Messias, Messiah. Okay? When he said he has anointed me, they didn't catch it. They didn't catch it. It was a subtle little thing in there real fast. He said, I am Christ. I am the Messiah. I have been anointed by God as king. Now, they didn't catch it. They just, they just heard a local boy doing a cool sermon. But that's what he said. He said, I am the king. Okay? And he is, what do they say? It's only bragging if you can't back it up, right? If, if, if an athlete says, I can do this, and they fail, they were bragging. If they, were, they succeed, yeah, they were just speaking truth. Jesus, in his life, did a lot of things that if they weren't true, they were just beyond comprehension bragging. Okay, like this one, where he says, I've been anointed by God. To be Messiah. Whoa. And what he's saying, in essence, is the story of Israel comes to its completion in me. All this stuff in Isaiah chapter 61 that you think is so important about the, the coming prophet, that's me. Everything God's been building toward ever since Abraham is me. You know, that wasn't the only time he did something that was just audacious. How many disciples did Jesus pick? He had, he had to pick a number. You're kind of used to it. What number did he use? Twelve. You know that, right? He got a dozen. How many tribes were there in Israel? Twelve. Here's what Scott McKnight says. What kind of person chooses a symbolic number twelve, which connects to the formation of Israel as a twelve-tribe people? Who, is, who calls himself anointed and then picks 12 people to follow him? He perceives himself to be the Lord of the 12. Now, he could have picked 11 and been number 12. Okay? Then he'd have been just one of them. No, he picks the right number, 12. Jesus, by appointing 12, saw history coming to completion and saw himself as Lord of that completion. When it comes to living for the kingdom, it starts with living Jesus. It starts with Jesus. It Middle is Jesus, end is Jesus. Now, we can, a lot of times we'll start living, for other, we want to be living for the kingdom. If you're a Christian, you're, you're, there's a part of you at least that wants to live for the kingdom. But there is other things that drag you. Like sometimes we find ourselves living for our career. Li living for that, and that, that's what drives us. And some, sometimes, I mean, these aren't bad things. Sometimes we end up living for our family. Our family is the number one thing. Our, my family, people say, is the most important thing in the world. Hmm. If there's somebody more important than Jesus, you're not living for Jesus and you're not living in the kingdom. I know that's hard to hear, especially in our culture, but put your helicopter remote away for just a minute and realize I live for Jesus over my family. I live for Jesus over my church. Okay? 
this group of people who gathers regularly, who do things that matter, who all the things that we do that I think are very, very good things, if they're not about Jesus, they're worthless. Because it's all about Jesus. And if we're not careful, Christianity deteriorates into being about what Jesus can do for me instead of being about Jesus. Oh, well, Jesus did this for me. Jesus did this. For me. Is it about Jesus? And let me, let me show you this. This is really wild. Because he's poking him with it. He's poking him with the truth. There's another truth he's poking him with. And it comes when he, Isaiah 61, they, they pick the scroll, they hand him the scroll. He goes to Isaiah 61, which is the reading for the day. And he starts in Isaiah 61, verse 1. Now, you remember what we just read. Now, let me read you the second couple verses out of Isaiah. This is going to sound exactly the same. The Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, to pr- and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Remember that period I told you to notice? That's where it went in the Greek. That's where it goes in the New Testament. When Jesus got to the year of the Lord's favor, he stopped, rolled up the scroll, and gave him back to the pe- person, and he stopped in mid-sentence. He didn't finish the entire phrase. Because what's the next phrase? And the day of vengeance for our God. Now, what did they want? We would like some vengeance from our God. Right? All all the Jews in that period, they're living under the Roman rule, under Roman oppression. They really want, they really, really want vengeance from God. Jesus gets to that spot and stops and doesn't talk about vengeance. I am, I guarantee you, the rabbis in that day, when they read this passage, normally they would em- emphasize the day of vengeance. They wouldn't talk about the poor and the prisoners. Who cares about them? We need vengeance. And then the next little section, I'm not going to read it to you, the next little section in Isaiah 61, he talks about how God's going to bless them and make everything wonderful and good. And Jesus didn't read that part. And then, look at verse 5, just a couple verses later, as he's still in this same thing that Jesus could have read. Strangers will shepherd your flocks, foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. You know what a Jew heard when they read that? In their day? You know who the strangers and foreigners were? Romans. This preached... You go back to the first century, this preached. When the Messiah comes, these Roman soldiers that are around here doing all this oppressing us, they're going to be picking your grapes. They're going to be taking care of your fields. They're going to be, taking, they're going to be mowing your yard. Because when God comes back, when the kingdom comes, all these strangers that are oppressing you are going to be serving you. Jesus didn't read that part. He read the part about the poor. He says, go back to remember what he said? Proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, period. And the second lesson we need to get about the kingdom of God from this is the kingdom of living is others focused it focuses on other people not you now this is hard because you're a selfish person okay i know this because that's the only flavor humans come in is selfish oh some people are altruistic and they're out there doing things but most people the more selfless they are the more they're wanting you to notice it okay How, how do you like it when you do something really good and nobody sees it you're like, check it. Anybody see that? Anybody catch that? I think I just, that was a really good thing. That was a really, really, really good thing that I just did. We want attention. We want respect. We want love. We want, we want, we want, we want, we want. Jesus says, I have come to take care of the people who can't take care of themselves. We refer to it here as helping the least. You know, going five and two food pantry, going to Cambodia, helping the least, looking for the, those who are there. Because that's kingdom living. When Jesus is announcing the kingdom, he doesn't talk about overthrowing the Roman government. He doesn't talk about all the cool stuff that comes our way. He doesn't talk about any of that stuff. He talks about us serving others. Okay? 
I mean, when Jesus is talking about the kingdom, he'll say, whoever humbles himself like this child, humbles themselves like this child, is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Humble? Wow. Again, we like to th- make people think we're humble. Okay? Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. Okay? So kingdom living is about serving others. It's about helping others. Like I said, Jesus poked them. They didn't catch any of this. Remember when he finished up, they go, oh, isn't he awesome? Isn't he just the most awesome thing ever? And that's what they're thinking. So then, like I said, he gets out both hands and he shoves them. Jesus continues he's to the people in the, in the synagogue there. Jesus said to them, surely you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, do it here in your hometown what you have heard, what we have heard you did in Capernaum. In other words, we, we heard some really cool stuff about you doing miracles up in Capernaum. When you were over there by Galilee, you were doing some really, really, you were kicking it with the miracles and stuff. We'd really like to see some of those. We heard the teaching now. Could you do some miracles now? Okay. And he's going, no. No. I'm the king, the king does what the king wants to do, not what you want the king to do. That's like being king, right? Okay? And then, after he's kind of shorted him a little bit, he comes back and says this, and, and we don't get this, because we're, we're, we don't understand the stuff they were living in. But he says this, I, sh- I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land. So, go back to the Old Testament, you go back to Kings, you've got the prophet Elijah, he predicts it's going to not rain for three and a half years, and so it doesn't, and he ends up hanging out with this widow in a place called Zarephath, okay? Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. In other words, there's a famine going on, which means everybody's hungry, and if you just picture a map of Israel, here's Israel, the people where, place where the Jew people live, Jewish people live, place where the good people, where God's people live, they're here. Up here is Sidon. It is not a quick trip. And God sends Elijah not to any of the widows or hurting people in Israel. He sends him way up where the heathen are to take care of a widow there. And Jesus just pulls that out and rubs them in their face. And then he says, goes to Elijah's successor, Elisha, and says that there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha, the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed. There's lepers everywhere, right? But only one was cleansed, Naaman the Syrian. Okay, you guys know this story, how Naaman is the king, and he has a servant girl, and the servant girl's Jewish because he kidnapped her and made her his servant, and he gets leprosy, and the servant girl says, you know, the prophet in Israel could fix you, and he travels all the way, as the enemy soldier, enemy general, travels all the way to Elisha, Elisha has him bathe in the Jordan, he comes out clean, pretty cool story. There were lots of lepers in Israel, And Elisha didn't tell any of them to go wash in the Jordan until they were clean. And if any of them thought they should copy this, any of them were going, you know what, it worked for that old guy. I'm going to try this too. There's a mass running, everybody in running to the Jordan, dipping themselves in the Jordan so they can get, nothing doesn't work. So Jesus says, you do notice how God works. He says, are you paying attention to how God actually works? Because how God actually works is he doesn't come to you who think you're the favorites. He goes to the ones who you don't like. He goes to that widow way up in Sidon. He helps Naaman, who's not just, Naaman's not just a foreigner, okay? Let's say this, Elisha was sent to help a widow, but not a Jewish one. Elisha healed one solitary leper in the entire world, and the leper was the commander of the enemy army. Tom Wright puts it, Israel's God was rescuing the wrong people. Now this, they noticed. This time they got it. When he says, yeah, yeah, you got to understand, when God's up to something, he's going to help the people you don't like. And at this, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard it. 
Now, notice how this went. I don't know if you, paid it, if you happened to catch it as we went through this. It started out back in verse 15 when it first was talking about up in Canaan, up, up in um, where he was teaching in the Galilee area. He was teaching in their synagogues. Everyone praised him. And then when, we, when he f- finishes his first section here in his hometown of Nazareth, all those pe- people spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. But now that he's pushed them, now that he said, no, 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 you don't understand what God wants in a king. You don't understand what God's going to do in a Messiah. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. Now listen to this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. I think, do you think they're upset? Think they're just a little bit unhappy? Yeah, they're, they're, I was in Israel a couple of years ago, and I was on this hill. There's the town of Nazareth, and there's this hill. And yeah, you could push somebody off, and it would be a bad day. And Jesus kind of just, I don't think I put it in here, but Jesus kind of slips out. They try. He just, oops, sorry, not, not time. They aren't able to, but they want to. Now, I'm going to give you something, and you're not going to like this one. Maybe you haven't liked any of them. You're really not going to like this one. But if you're truly living the kingdom, it's not popular. It's not a popular thing. It's not popular today. It never has been popular. I mean, there's a reason if you go back to the early church that in, in Rome they were, they were killing Christians. It's, it's not a coincidence that if you come to the modern world and you go to certain nations on earth, people are killing Christians. And it's not a coincidence that in America, if you stand up for what actually is in the Bible, you're not going to be popular. No matter which side, you, whenever what you do, somebody's going to be ticked off at you. If, you. if you're trying to reach the lost people, the people who are far from God, you're trying to reach them and you're saying they matter to God and we should put energy into helping these people, there are people who are going to say, you're just judgmental. Everybody has their own way to God. There's many ways to God. Yeah, all of them lead through Jesus. If they don't lead through Jesus, they won't get you to God. And that's not popular. There's a lot of people who don't like it when we say that, that there's no way to get to God except through Jesus. Now, I'm not being, I'm not being judgmental. I'm just trying to be accurate. I mean, I, I, don't, know if you, I don't know if you noticed they've got a gate closed on, on Fort Liberty. If you notice they've got a gate closed. There's orange signs everywhere, you know, because Man- it's Manchester Gate, right? Manchester Gate is closed, so you've got to go. I think if I figured out the route, if you want to get through the, where the Manchester Gate is from here, you go to Raleigh, is that right? And then you cut through Durham, a little bit of Chapel Hill, down through Cary, and then you can actually get to the gate. That, am I am getting it close? It looks like, it, I mean, these signs just sort of disappear into the woods. Manchester Gate detour, and I'm like, that's not even a road. But you know what? If all the other roads are closed, that's how you get there. If all the other roads, I mean, when I, when there was a, a hurricane came through when I was in first in ministry, and it, it, it just tore through the town we were living in. And to get to our house from the church, it used to be just for, when we, for, and you just went, and you were there. Okay, leave the church, go down this road, turn. But if you, now, it's about a mile. For a while there, if you went this way for a little bit, there were trees here. And so you turned this way a little bit, and you went a block or two, and then there were more trees. And then you went this way a little bit, and there were more trees, and you had to, the path home was this. Okay? How judgmental. How dare you say the only way to your house is by taking all these roads. There's many ways to get to your house. Not after a hurricane, there's not. After a hurricane, there's one. And if one person dies for your sins, if he pays the penalty so you can be reconciled to God, if one person does that and nobody else does, there's only one path to God. I'm not being judgmental. I'm just telling you all the other roads are out. I mean, I, you can say what you want about Muhammad's road, but he didn't die to get me to God, so his road won't work. You can say the same thing about Buddha, about Confucius. You can say about all of them. Moses didn't die for my sins. There's only one road. But when I say that, some people think I'm judgmental. Okay. 
when it comes to that, I'm judgmental. There's no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. And if anybody else ever dies for my sins and rises from the dead, we'll take that into consideration. Okay, but I think we're clean. But, see, he started out talking about the lost, talking about a lot about Elijah helping um, the, the, the widow. He's talked about Elisha helping Naaman, those people who are lost, who are far from God, the ones they didn't want to reach. But he also talked about who? He talked about the poor. I mean, it's not an, it's not a mis- it's not an accident that when Jesus announces who he is, the first thing he says is, I'm here to help the poor. That's not an accident. I just finished another, because I'm, I'm in school and I've got to read books, and some of the books are good, and sometimes they just miss stuff that's just so obvious. And I just read a 200 and some page book on discipleship that didn't talk about helping people at all. It was like, yeah, you can be a disciple. I'm like, you can be a disciple and not help people? I don't think you got the same Bible I got. I don't think you've been paying, if, if it was it first of the year or end of last year, I actually went through like a huge chunk of the Bible showing here's, here's how God talks about caring for the poor in every stinking section of the Bible and almost every book. And if you think you can skip that part, you're skipping the Bible. But if you do that, if you live for the poor, and as he says in the Isaiah passage, and speak out to set the oppressed free, well then you're woke. You know, you're, you're woke, you care about the poor too much, you say things about helping people, you don't, you're just woke. No, I'm just a Jesus follower. And the first thing Jesus says when he's going to announce that he is the king is I'm here to help the poor. Okay, I don't make this stuff up. Here's something you've got to understand about, about, I think, Christianity, but about me. I've read the book a bunch. Not those books, I'm talking about the Bible. I didn't know any better. When I first became a Christian, I didn't know any better. Somebody said, you should read the Bible every day. So I did. And they didn't tell me I was only supposed to read certain parts. They didn't tell me to ignore things. So I just read the Bible, and I read it through over and over. I've read the Bible through 30 sometimes, at least. Okay? And what happens when you just read the Bible through over and over and over and over and over again, you keep noticing how God talks about caring for the poor and the least and those who are hurting and how much emphasis God puts on that throughout the entire book. And if you're going to be a Christian and you're going to tell me you're not caring for the poor in some way, I'm going to tell you you're not reading the book right. Not because I know how to read it better, just I know how to read. Okay? And it doesn't matter what people call me, it doesn't matter what people call us. They can call us judgmental because we believe people need Jesus Christ in order to get to God. And they can call us woke because we care too much about the poor. And I'm sure if Jesus were to show back up right now, there would be people calling him woke and judgmental. Matter of fact, they might even try to throw him off a cliff. Wouldn't be the first time. Okay? Now, those were the ones you didn't like this is the hard one because one thing that just flows through this entire process how do i live for the kingdom is there is there a bottom line single statement that gets me there i think this is close to it because kingdom living starts by letting jesus reign in every area of our lives every area now we don't like that. The illustration I normally use here is about when somebody's coming over to visit, and it's a, and it's a rush visit. You don't know they were coming. They said, I'll be here in 15 minutes. And you choose a room. Right? You pick one room in the house, and that's the room where everything that's junk, everything that's laying in the wrong place, every sock, everything that's in the middle of the floor gets stuffed in that room, and then you put something in front of it so the, family, the people who are visiting can't get in that room. Right, because that's the room that's off limits to everybody else. In our lives, we tend to have rooms that are off limits to God. And we have to say, God, you're allowed in every room. You are king in every room. You are God in every room. Abraham Kuyper, you're not, not going to believe this. This guy, Abraham Kuyper, lived at the, into the into the 18th, into the 1900s, was, you're not going to believe this, he was a politician and a theologian. Dutch. Good at both. 
He was an outstanding theologian, and he was prime minister of Holland. Serious. You can look him up. And here's his most famous saying. Can you imagine a prime minister or a president saying this? There's not a square inch in the whole domain of human existence over which Christ, who is Lord over all, does not exclaim, mine. That's deep. Let's do it again. There's not a square inch in the whole domain of human existence over which Christ, who is Lord over all, does not exclaim, mine. And that includes your life. That includes my life. That includes not just literal physical inches. It includes every millimeter of every aspect of my life. It, it includes how I treat my family. Now, I said something about how, how living for the kingdom doesn't mean putting your family first. Living for the kingdom means I live my family, I live the kingdom into my family. It means I live the kingdom into my work. It li- means I live the kingdom into my church. It means I live the kingdom into my attitudes. Whoo! There's not an inch in all creation. If there's an attitude that you have that is not that Jesus can't say mine. I need to work on changing that attitude. If there are relationships in my life over which Jesus can't exclaim mine, I need to work on that relationship. If there's a habit over which Jesus cannot proclaim mine, I need to change that habit. That's heavy. Isn't that heavy? That's the inventory. that's, that's That's why in Psalms, It says to search me, O God, know my heart, try me, see my anxious thoughts, see if there's anything in me that doesn't line up with your will. And so, well, I guess that could be the challenge for the day, couldn't it? Ask God, what God examine my heart, what in my life needs to be aligned with you? What part of my life am I not allowing you to say mine? What part of my life am I blocking you out of? And then work on opening that door. Attitudes, relationships, actions, habits, hobbies, viewing habits, listening habits. Is there anywhere where I'm not allowing God to say mine? That's heavy stuff. That's kingdom. That's how an ambassador has to live. We are Christ's ambassadors. If you're an ambassador in a foreign country, there's certain things they're just not going to let you do. Because you represent, and I represent, Jesus Christ in every area of my life. One of those areas that we need to let God say mine over is our time. You've got 164 hours this coming week. I don't know if you knew that. You've got 164 hours. Now, being a pastor, I get 164 hours. Being a young mom, you get 164 hours. Being an executive, you got, being a high ranking, you got whatever, you got 164 hours. And over all 164, Jesus proclaims mine. That doesn't mean you got to be praying the whole time. But it does mean if I look at your calendar, I might have an inkling, an inkling, who your king is. You may need to adjust that. You may be doing a lot of things and you're not serving God in any way, shape, or form. I'm going to challenge you that way. One of the things, we do a lot of things here that are two-edged. Like we have a lot of ministries here at the church. A lot of them on Sunday morning. We have children's ministry and first impressions and worship and tech. And we've got all these, all these ministries in the church. And at one level, they're about making sure we can do the things we need to do as a church. But you know what they're more about? They're more about you learning to sacrifice some time and give some of those 164 hours to God. My hope for everybody who's in our church serving in ministry is that that's the first step in ministry. Not the last step. You know, they're, they're active in this. But are they also doing... And then here's the list of how they're living for Jesus in every area of their life. And if you'd like to join a ministry, just go to the ministry. I like to do it on the app. You can go to the app and say serve and pick something. Okay? If you want to join the church, we've got, a, we've got a meeting coming up in April. The, do you know the time, the date? Me too. It's about a month away. And we'll be doing a next steps class. You can join that find out about the church. 
But the important thing, the most important thing is this right here. Jesus is king. If you're going to kingdom live, you live for Jesus. Every area of my life, every attitude, everything else is about living for Jesus. Got that? Simple lesson for the day. Hard to apply, simple lesson. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you. Father, I thank you that Jesus is Lord, that he is king, that he is master, that he is Messiah, that he is Christ. He's not just some teacher. He's not even just the one who died for my sins, though he did that. He's not just the one who rose from the dead, though he did that too. He is Lord over all. Lord, help me to live that way. Help me to live every second of every minute of every day with at least the awareness that Jesus is Lord. Father, let me make all my decisions with the understanding that Jesus is king, that he is my master and I am his ambassador. Father, this is hard. This is hard for a lot of people here in the room, a lot of people online. It's hard for me. But Lord, there's no square inch of the creation and no minuscule part of my person over which Jesus doesn't proclaim mine. Father, give me the courage, the strength, and the wisdom to live that. It's in Jesus' name I pray.